Perfect. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to our last board meeting of the year. Um, bittersweet. Um, we'll just uh, jump right into it. Um, if everyone can take a look at the meeting minutes from last month, November, um, if you have any comments or revisions, now is the time to share. The only one I have is that on the top left, it says Zoom virtual retreat. I wish we had had a retreat. It was very much a long meeting. Nope. That's all I've got. Anyone else? All right. Can I have a motion to approve those uh, November meeting minutes then? So I have a motion. Okay, Ahmed, motion, and do I have a second? I see Shara, all in favor? Any opposed? Okay, motion carries, meeting minutes are approved. Um, looks like we're moving on to public comment. Yeah, so it looks like we have um, two guests. We have Jody Monroy and Alan Bean. Um, would either of you like to make a comment at this point? You can raise your hand or let us know in the chat. Uh, no, this is Alan Bean. I'm just attending for the uh, first time, if everybody can hear me. And I'm here in Beaverton, Black-owned business, just trying to see what's going on in the diversity side of things. So I'm a uh, developer and a general contractor. So I'm just participating to see if there's any opportunities to help out or see what's going on. So I'm just here for, for the uh, information. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks for introducing yourself, Alan. Welcome. Jody, would you uh, like Jody. to say Yes. I just wanted to say hi to everyone. I miss seeing everyone in person and hi to everyone. Hi. Hello, hello. We'll just mention um, there's a couple of folks that are trying to get in and we're having trouble getting them in. So Kirill is with us and Teresa should be with us as well, but just working on getting them in. So just FYI. But that is all the public comment that we have. Thank you both. Wonderful. Um, and Alexis, I've tried to I've tried to admit her all too and it's not working for me either so something funky happening yeah Girl, um at least i'm just gonna at least let you unmute your microphone so you can talk until we can get you in cool all right um moving on to liaison reports then starting with uh counselor since you see yeah, glad I was able to make it. Sorry, Monday nights have turned to be a little bit challenging. Uh, I will be leaving the meeting early, and I apologize for that. Um, first of all, we have one more council meeting this year, and that is tomorrow night. Uh, the agenda for that has been posted. If anybody's interested in looking at the details, um, probably the primary things of interest that you folks might find intriguing. One is the uh, recommendations for appointments to the boards and commissions are going to be taken care of tomorrow night. And that includes some uh, new appointments here to the Diversity Advisory Board. So um, that should be good. And some members of the Diversity Advisory Board are being appointed elsewhere. And that should be good, too. So um, a, lot of, a lot of interesting things in there. Um, we don't have a lot of really complicated agenda items tomorrow night. We're going to be getting an update from our staff about the Climate Action Plan, what's been going on over the course of the last year. So if people are interested in what has been done to date, um, that's coming up. Since the council did um, populate a climate action task force, uh, in fact, that's part, part of the, uh, the boards and commissions um, uh, recommendations. Um, actually, no, I, that was done a little earlier. So never mind, that, that's, not, that's not in the, uh, the agenda tomorrow night. But the committee has been starting to kind of get its shape and getting its direction, both from staff and, and from conversations with counselors. So we should start to see some you know, more focused uh, recommendations from the uh, Climate Action Task Force, which will help us do additional work on that. Plus, I think some people may find it really interesting. There's going to be a presentation on some work that the uh, Washington County transportation staff have been doing over the last few years related to 
expanding transit service across the county. Um, TriMet is the primary regional transit agency. Uh, its board is appointed by the governor. Um, it's independent of Metro and the local county governments. So it's sort of a separate governmental entity of its own, but it, it's there to serve all of us across the region. But it isn't always able to provide local service. And so a number of local service options have been developed and the, the county studies have been, among other things, poking into the questions of what more could we do to provide additional service beyond the trunk line things, such as the max lines or the major high traffic lines that, that people are probably fairly familiar with. Local service would let uh, a lot more people get access to public transit and get access to more destinations such as stores. So um, we're hopeful that some good possibilities can come up that we can all afford. Um, then um, I think there may be a, a, a there may be some surprise associated with this, but people may find uh, if they tune in tomorrow, if they look on the agenda, that there is a proclamation uh, in recognition to Councilor Mark Fagan, who has um, declared that he will be resigning his post early. Um, his term officially ends at the end of 2024. Um, but uh, for reasons of you know, personal reasons that, that mostly relate to uh, work conflict with, with city council work, um, he's stepping aside early, which means that there will be yet another council seat open in the uh, 2022 elections. So uh, election season in Beaverton will be fairly busy in May. Um, and everybody will, uh, who has an interest in that should definitely tune in and, and start thinking about what you want to do with respect to uh, um, Beaverton City Council races, either helping people, supporting people, or considering it for yourself. Um, we had a council retreat on Saturday. Um, what we do in the council retreats typically is talk at, at kind of higher levels about overall priorities for the city. Since we have seven members of the council now, uh, this is the first time that all seven members of the council had been in a room together. Um, we, we were in the council chambers um, and uh, there were very few other people there, but I believe there's probably an audio recording of the six hour long session for those who have the, the, the patience to, to sit through that. There will be summary material published about what kinds of high level priorities were developed. And then the city manager and the administration will be working on developing recommend, recommended responses to our um, uh, elected um, goals and objectives. So um, there's plenty of work left to be done um, to take what we did Saturday and turn it into actions. Um, and that's going to be informed by all the other work that everybody else has been doing in the boards and commissions, including this one. So a lot going on there. And with that, I'll, I'll pause and ask if anybody has any questions, either about things I've said or things that I haven't. Hi, uh, Anna here. So uh, you have a question. Was there any progress or talks on the um, American Rescue Plan? Well, not during the retreat. Um, the, the ARPA discussions that we had about a month or so ago are the most recent. Um, there were some, you know, very specific recommendations for how the, the, the rest of tranche one of the money was to be allocated. And that will be folded into next year's budget. And uh, certain elements of that were approved for immediate spending through the supplemental budget process, um, uh, which is where we had the, the largest part of that discussion. But there's a significant chunk of tranche two, which is the eight and a half million dollars that should be coming into the city in April or May. A significant fraction of that has not yet been allocated. Um, there were some preliminary discussions um, during the supplemental budget meeting about how we might want to do that but we quite deliberately chose not to make decisions about the second tranche yet because there's, there's room for lots more conversation. Um, part of it is the city has to look at its budget and see kind of where we are in terms of, of revenue and expenses and how those match up against each other. There are some interesting impacts from inflation. Uh, there are some interesting impacts from um, uh, potentially diminished uh, rates of, of property value increase so that perhaps our property tax uh, revenues might not increase as much as we had anticipated. There may be lower um, um, revenues from some of the franchise fees or other things. So uh, our fin finance team is trying to gather all the relevant data and sort that out. And that'll tell us 
whether we need to consider using some of the second tranche for um, budget backfill. Um, but whatever is not used for that can be used for programmatic purposes. And, and that is what we'll be spending some time talking about probably in January, February. I'm in. Thank you. Uh, so until we talk about the budget, like um, I know from my resource, we will have like uh, as an origin in general, one uh, like 1,002, around 1,200 1, uh, Afghani family from the uh, like refugee programs. And from my knowledge, like Portland will not be the first uh, option for them. Many of them, they want to move to uh, be written, especially like the Afghani community growing up fast here in be written. Do we have any program we will uh, consider or anything in the budget? Maybe we'll be specific for the Afghani uh, families who will arrive super soon. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and uh, the city of Beaverton works pretty closely with all of the refugee support and resettlement organizations that operate in the Portland metro region and in the state, but but largely in the Portland metro region. We have, we have a pretty long history of, of doing work as needed to uh, help support the refugee communities as they are allocated to the, or, to the state of Oregon and to our region. So, you know, we, we take seriously the, 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 the phrase that we've adopted for ourselves, which is that we are a welcoming city. And we will try to apply whatever resource we can, which could be some ARPA funding, it could be some general fund dollars. I mean, it it's, it's, remains to be seen what, what is needed in order to help um, resettle uh, folks through this program. Um, but we have said in public and in continuing conversations with our partners, that Beaverton is ready to help out in, in whatever way that we can um, to, to bring refugees into situations that are, are comfortable and stable for them. And, and if, if a lot of those are in Beaverton, that's great. You know, we're happy to do that. Um, I, I do know we have, we have uh, welcomed refugees to, to Beaverton before, um, and we will do so again. So um, the, the details are just you know, still ahead of us. Now, in fact, I, I, I can probably tell you that if anybody's going to be involved in this work, um, it, Alexis is likely to be one of them. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, me too. Like I have a good experience with that too. Like uh, because I work as a uh, main case manager with resettlement agency with Catholic Church before. But right. my concern will be like the housing. Uh, we already have a crisis housing and and be within. And if ten percent from those 1,200 families will decided to live in Beaverton, that means we will need like at least 120 units. So with all those things, um, I don't know, like I wish we will have like a, not emergency plan, but a good preparation before we will have an issue with that too. So good luck, like we, and if you need as a, I mean, as a council, if they need any help from the community, we will be more than happy to help. Yeah, and, and I, I do know that the financial impact of resettlement does not always fall 100% on the local <laughs> the local government. The state and the federal government participate as well. But, but, you know, again, the details have to be sorted out. All yours, Rachel. All right, thank you. Always informative. Um, we'll move right along to uh, Lieutenant Kingsbury, please, with your uh, Beaverton Police Department liaison report. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just have a couple things. Uh, one, last month during the meeting, Ahmed, you had uh, brought up a shooting investigation. Um, I believe the location was uh, Western and Allen, and it was a, my understanding is it was a, uh, kind of a drive-by style, uh, shooting. Um, so I did look into that, uh, for you. Um, it's still an open investigation, so I'm not actually permitted to share, uh, any information about the status of it. I know that's kind of anticlimactic, but, 
in order to to protect the integrity of the investigation. I, I just can't share those details, and I hope you understand that. Okay, good. Thumbs up. Uh, second uh, thing I wanted to share this month. Um, it's my understanding that uh, uh, later in last month's meeting, uh, when um, the DEI 2021 plan was being reviewed, there was a uh, question regarding um, uh, public safety uh, indicator 5.2, the city regularly reaffirms and furthers its commitment to being a sanctuary city. And at the end of the uh, status uh, paragraph, just to the right of it, um, there's a sentence that reads the 2021 Oregon legislature enacted statutes addressing cooperation with federal immigration authorities, which are currently being used to update BPD policy. And so uh, just to share, um, I did a little bit of research on Oregon House Bill uh, 3265. It looks like it was signed by the governor on July 19th, uh, 2021. And there was a directive uh, issued by um, the chief of police, Rhonda Groshong, on August 9th. And the, um, the time period there from July 19th to August 9th is likely when the uh, chief or the deputy chief uh, were reviewing the implications of, of these legislative updates and formulating a response to the, the department members. And uh, in aligning our procedures with these updates, um, that's when the chief issued this directive uh, to all personnel. And essentially the directive um, restates the, um, the legal requirements um, for the um, operations of the police department based on the, the Oregon House Bill 3265. And it essentially reaffirms that the BPD doesn't do immigration enforcement. Um, there were some additional um, um, requirements added uh, to include things uh, like, uh, like we're, not, we're not permitted to allow ICE or immigration authorities to be in non-public areas. They can come into the lobby like a citizen, but they can't come into our private areas. Uh, they're not privy to our, our information discussed behind those, those closed doors or any, any of our custodies within the building. Um, I, um, I should have sent this out beforehand, but I'm gonna send the, the uh, portion of the directive that talks about immigration enforcement related to House Bill 3265 to uh, Alexis to forward out so you guys can understand exactly uh, kind of what I'm, um, what I'm talking about. It basically, that sentence though reaffirms that we're doing everything that's required of us in House Bill uh, 3265 without any deviation at all. So does anybody have any questions about that? No, that was great. Thank you so much. That was actually my question and you oh. answered my question. So I appreciate that. Okay. And I want to uh, thank you again for uh, your thoughts on Surgeon Gaunt last month. I apologize if it's just very new. I wasn't prepared to talk about it, but um, we, we definitely appreciated it. I don't see any other questions. So Alexis, I'm going to email out this uh, portion of the, the directive to you, if you could forward that to the the members that appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much for your um, for your follow up on on the items from last month. Really appreciate that. Um, all right, it is time for our first presentation of the meeting um, on a Cooper Mountain update. We have Casera Phipps here from the city of Beaverton. She is the senior planner or, or a senior planner. I assume there are multiple. Um, so welcome and uh, we'll give you the floor. All right, thank you, Rachel. And hello everyone. Um, I'm Casera Phipps. It's been a while since I have been to the Diversity Advisory Board. I see a couple of familiar faces and names, so good to uh, see you. 
I wanted to give a, a brief update on the project. Um, and as the agenda indicates, we are also um, putting out the call for, for any volunteers who might be interested in assisting us with uh, evaluating the alternatives um, that I will show here in just a few minutes. So to get started, um, and can everybody see my presentation? Get a thumbs up maybe? Okay, cool. Uh, so for anyone um, who isn't familiar with the area, um, it is 1,200 acres at the southwestern edge of Beaverton city limits that was recently added to the region's urban growth boundary. And that's really a first step in the process to preparing land for development. Uh, so ultimately this project is going to increase the city's housing supply. And we are trying to figure out uh, how to provide new neighborhoods, um, including roads, uh, trails, uh, you know, schools, natural resources, parks, homes, uh, everything that goes along with, uh, with creating new neighborhoods. Um, and we need to provide at least 3,760 new homes in this area. Uh, and that includes both, uh, both detached and multifamily homes. We are using a, a racial equity framework for this project. So that not only affects how we do our engagement, but how we do some of our technical work as well. And um, we really look to the DEI plan um, to uh, give us some guidance on um, how to do these kind of large new planning efforts. So kudos to this group. Um, I'll briefly touch on the project goals. Um, I won't read these verbatim, but just to get kind of a, a flavor uh, for everything that this, this project touches on. Um, our first goal is on equitable outcomes for new residents. I see that as kind of the umbrella goal that, that covers them all because there are so many uh, interdependencies there. Uh, we have a goal to provide a variety of housing types as well as for all income levels, including affordable housing. Uh, to preserve and connect natural resources, uh, thinking about community resilience um, because there are steep slopes and potential uh, hazards like wildfire or landslides, uh, providing public facilities and infrastructure, so not just roads but the, the pipes that go underneath them too, um, and, and everything that it takes to provide uh, services, providing uh, access to destinations, so transportation options, not just driving, but walking, biking, and hopefully transit. Uh, and then commercial opportunities, uh, making sure that people have places to go for goods and services. And then last um, uh, is how do we make this all happen? We need to make sure that we have a realistic and responsible funding strategy. So where we are in the process, uh, we are nearing the end of phase two. We spent the first year doing a lot of, of research. Uh, we are now um, at the point where we're all developing alternative solutions on the second bullet point under phase two. And I'll explain it in a bit more detail here what that means. Uh, but ultimately we're going to move um, into phase three where we're producing goals, policies, um, and a community plan document itself that will be adopted um, into our comprehensive plan. That's our long-term planning um, document for the city. And then we'll also have code changes that are needed to implement it. Uh, so that's all expected to wrap up at the end of 2022. And then after that would, would be when potentially annexation and developments could occur. So we're, we're still a ways out. Um, and then I'll just note at the bottom that we have a, a separate utility plan that's taking place. Um, and then we've been doing engagement all along. And I wanted to give a shout out to Mana Jay because she is on our community advisory committee for the project. So right now we're at the alternative phase. Uh, this map shows potential new neighborhood areas. They're kind of these um, blobs uh, that, that have a dashed line around them. So this is where generally there, there aren't as steep of slopes, um, there are fewer natural resources, in some cases there's um, less existing development, 
And, and this is where future growth is expected to be concentrated in the Cooper Mountain area. And we're going through the process of laying out different options for how these neighborhoods could develop. So we're looking at different features like housing types, total number of housing units, different uh, transportation connections and levels of natural resource protections between these three alternatives. Um, and that's very in, intentional to, to show different options because it, it highlights the trade-offs that we need to consider. And what we will likely end up with is some sort of a, a hybrid where we take kind of the, the pieces that we like best from each of these alternatives and put it into what we'll call a preferred approach or preferred alternative. Okay. This is normally something I would spend probably five minutes <laughs> at least explaining. So I'll do my best, uh, kind of the, the elevator pitch here. Uh, these maps show um, land use and transportation. Um, I should say the kind of major roads. Um, we also have trails planned for these areas, but because they're generally the same um, and it makes for a very busy map, um, we kind of limited what we're, we're showing here. So. The red that you see are, are commercial nodes or commercial areas. Uh, orange is multifamily. You can think of apartment buildings. Um, the, the black line that is shown are on the existing arterial roads. Um, and then these gray lines that are shown in the middle are potential uh, new roads. And then the um, this color green here are generally natural resource areas. And then the kind of lime uh, shade of green are parks. So we have a, a community park that's called Winkleman Park, and then a, a large uh, park here that is a Cooper Mountain Nature Park. And so some of the differences that you see across these alternatives um, are are these roadways. We have different alignments. You might see. Um, certain pieces aren't shown on, on other alternatives. Um, and so that means that there may be different levels of connectivity and also different um, impacts to the creek system because we're talking about big bridges that are needed to, to cross these, these creek areas. And so there are um, impacts to the wildlife and connectivity um, in, in creating those new connections. Uh, we also see some new uh, green areas that are shown. So those are um, potential parks. Um, parks are shown under each of them, but they vary in acreage. Um, and then you'll also notice that we have purple shown on a couple of maps and that's more flexible um, zoning. It would allow for residential or commercial, or it could be both. Um, if you've heard of kind of live work set up or it would allow someone to run a, a hair salon or a business out of their garage if they wanted to. And it could allow for structures to change in use over time as well. So I know this is really quick, I'm rushing through. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna go to the next, uh, next slide here. And this really gets at um, the uh, call for volunteers. So we are going to do an evaluation of these three alternatives. And if we think back to the project goals, uh, we want to come up with uh, measurements. So how do we know if we're successful in, um, in reaching our housing goal or our natural resource goal? So we've come up with some ways to measure those. Um, some examples are shown here on the right. Um, they don't apply to, to just one uh, goal, but thinking about you know, how are those housing types um, distributed in each neighborhood? Do you have all of your multifamily housing in one and then detached homes in another uh, neighborhood or are they uh, mixed? So we have the uh, opportunity for people in each of these neighborhoods by providing different housing types. Uh, that's just an example. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're, we're going to try to identify what the, the best uh, elements are of each of these, uh, each of these alternatives. And as we do engagement uh, next year and, and the, to the spring, we're going to be asking the community to help us identify the pros and cons of each of those alternatives, not necessarily thinking of their favorite, maybe or C, 
uh, but understanding what those trade-offs and implications are. So we are uh, right now finalizing those metrics or evaluation criteria. We'll be uh, updating our maps, um, and, and we're also kind of plugging in uh, numbers uh, where we do have some quantitative metrics. But one of the um, I think more qualitative um, aspects of this is how do we do an equity analysis? So we've been um, thinking of kind of an equity index um, where we would uh, bring community members together to review these alternatives in a bit more uh, detail and, and having some of those other quantitative pieces in front of us. So we might know what greenhouse gas emissions are, or we might know um, how many trips the commercial areas are expected to um, get each day um, to help us understand, you know, what are those uh, equity impacts um, and how do they differ between these different alternatives? Uh, and so once we complete um, all of the, uh, uh, analysis, thinking of the uh, evaluation, we'll go out to the community um, roughly February through uh, April of next year to, to get asked, what are those pros and cons of each of these? And then we'll summarize that input and come to city council. And that's when we'll kind of pivot toward um, developing that preferred alternative. So I will, um, end it there, but I'm happy to answer any general questions about the project, but was also wondering if, uh, if members might be interested in participating in this equity analysis of the alternatives that would take place in late January or potentially early February, depending on um, your availability. Teresa. Hi, thank you, Kassara, very much for being here and presenting that to us. I wanted to raise a question, and I'm not sure if my fellow board members had the opportunity to listen in on the city council meeting from last week. Um, I had the opportunity to listen in on this presentation, so I feel like I'm a little bit ahead of the curve there. But I would like to just reiterate uh, for my colleagues who may not have heard some of the points that were made previously, by council members because they are important and I believe they should be said again that, uh, and you highlighted on that, the trade-offs and implications of each. I think it's really important for the community to have an opinion and understand fully if we choose, you know, the maximum number of homes that can be built to account for housing supply and affordability. Um, what are the environmental trade-offs of that, right? versus if we were to choose perhaps a middle ground, something that is a hybrid, once again, there weren't any grocery stores that were implicated in that plan. And we certainly don't want to create a food desert as we continue to develop that area. And city council, our great leaders have uh, intergovernmental conversations and conversations with TriMet and Metro to get transportation out there. We had a really rousing discussion here at the Diversity Advisory Board just last month that I would encourage you to go back and watch regarding housing. And although affordability and supply are very important, we also had several board members say they don't want um, toy homes or Cracker Jack homes or, you know, very small homes that the value of them, we don't feel like they're necessarily worth living in, if that makes sense, not to, you know, throw shade on the developers or anything like that. And we had a presentation earlier this year from Rob Zoller. So we understand the implications that over time, the lot sizes are getting smaller, and we're needing to build up, not wider. But the quality of housing and the community is still something that we value and we want to try and see the livability of these neighborhoods really shown through. So even if that means a hybrid of, you know, 4,000 homes while planning a grocery store or two, understanding the traffic implications for this and trying to minimize environmental impact, all of those things are things that we here at the Diversity Advisory Board have discussed. And um, I think 
with all of our varying opinions, we echo more or less what the community at large is thinking about. But I would like to just reiterate, um, I would like to know more about the trade-offs and implications of this plan. And um, you had mentioned a metrics for housing and knowing what we should do. I would really, I have to put my H tag hat on for the housing five-year action plan that that is something they're currently going to do in 2022. The first year of the five-year housing action plan is done and we're on to our second year, but to create a metric for the third year, um, if you have read that five-year housing action plan, there is the five-year goal to have X number of homes as supply um, and you know the hope of having a certain number of affordable homes. I know it's very difficult for developers to be incentivized to build develop their affordable housing homes specifically, not just apartment complexes. And with that, for multi-generational families, as Ahmed said, I'm not sure if you were able to hear him earlier, that with uh, refugee and immigrant families coming into Oregon with an interest specifically in Beaverton, and they are families, not single people necessarily, or husband and wife, and so to account for more um, multi-generational, larger families, not just a studio or one bedroom. And I understand that is where the money is to some extent, but the reality of homes in Beaverton and trying to reduce um, kind of capacity that we're already experiencing is to have um, at least three bedrooms. And I know it's as a long-term planner, you can only do so much, but I just wanted to throw all those things out there and it's recorded. So if you missed anything, you can go back and watch it later. And also just to encourage you to listen in to just 10 minutes of our November meeting. It was a very passionate, rousing discussion. And I apologize for taking over a lot of time, but being on DAB and it's my last meeting and also being the liaison for the Housing Technical Advisory Group, I just really want to emphasize those two things. And with that, I yield my time to Ahmed. I see his hand. Thank you, Theresa. And honestly, we will miss you a lot. Like uh, you are one of the fighters for the refugee and immigrant uh, rights. So um, I have two questions, honestly. Uh, from my uh, acknowledgement that Microsoft will move one of their um, manufacturer, like big manufacturer to Cornelius Pass area. Um, and uh, my concern with when that project will be done, this project will be done, and all those units will occupy from their uh, uh, employee. So if there are any rules, we will have it to make that competition not be high, like what we have now in Shellis Ferry Road, with, as Teresa mentioned, like we call it Toy House, three level, that wide. And if I will be sneezing inside, it maybe it will fall down and <laughs> with my size. And now less one, it's more than $650,000. So for uh, families who is refugees or immigrants, or they have, they came with that expectation or with that American dream, they can own a house one day and they don't want like to leave it. Honestly, I live in this city almost now more than seven years. And um, I got many offers around Beaverton to buy a house. I didn't want to, honestly, because I'm in love with the city. I don't want like to move. So I, I think the duty for the city now is try to figure out something to help us to buy, like, especially for the first uh, home buyers. Because I know there's many programs, but will not work. Like 10,000 comparing with 700,000 will do nothing, even if it's not 3%. So uh, I need to put that in, like to put that or like think about it. Like if there any um, um, role for the, you mentioned like it will be affordable. So what the affordable mean, like mean for the, let's say it's the first class people or the immigrant and refugee people, which affordable you mean? This is number one. Number two, if there are any rules, we will have it at least to make the competition 
through like uh, maybe a lottery, through like uh, sort of like a habitat house uh, style, they will be um, able to do like home visit for those people who want to buy a house in that area and to see how much they need or they can make it affordable. I don't like, I know it's a business and I totally understand that, but we need to make it affordable to our people so they can like, we want this city to extend. So make it, make it easier for people to move there. I know many people, they want to have like new homes, but with the greater prices, we will have more people. Thank you so much. Thank you. If I could maybe respond to, to a couple of the questions. Um, one, affordability, we're talking about the kind of full range of incomes and including regulated affordable housing. Uh, all of the alternatives have a target of 10% affordable housing units. Um, and so that's something that, uh, you know, should we, um, uh, you know, through our engagement land on our, you know, number of total housing units, we'll have a good idea, idea of what the um, affordable housing units are and can then try to uh, put that into place. Um, the Metro affordable housing bond was, um, it played a large role in, in allowing us to provide regulated affordable housing in South Cooper Mountain. Um, and so that's kind of where that 10% that target comes from. Uh, and typically when we do have, uh, you know, new buildings opening that are, that are affordable housing, um, that's often with a, um, you know, service provider, nonprofit, and, and we do uh, try to promote those opportunities uh, with community members. Um, as far as the kind of range and, and size and types of homes, uh, and, and I know that you heard from Rob Zoller on the housing options project, that really changes how the city can go about regulating things like uh, lot size and, and which housing types are allowed where. And so um, I, I, one way we may be able to kind of uh, approach this for Cooper Mountain that's a bit unique is that because there are these uh, significant natural resources in the area, we're um, thinking about a, uh, uh, designation that requires some open space uh, requirements. So you might have development, but then a larger um, you know, open space area beside the house so that you don't feel so closed in. I, I know what you mean by the kind of cookie cutter houses, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act, right? We want to increase our housing supply, create um, new housing, which, generally tends to be more expensive than our existing housing stock. So, um, you know, that we want this to be welcoming to everyone. I think another thing this project can do is, is also um, open up other areas of the, the city too that have existing housing stock. So it's, um, as Teresa noted, there's a, a good discussion at council last week and there's so many uh, factors and interdependencies. We're talking about transportation and natural resources and commercial development and housing. And so it's very complex um, and it's an exciting opportunity for, for the city to be planning a new area at the scale. So uh, Alexis, I was curious um, for kind of the, the equity uh, discussion um, would you like me to send you an email um, with a bit of information or should members maybe contact you if they're interested? Yeah, so, because Sarah, am I understanding right? You you haven't set a, a date for that meeting. You're going to set it around the folks that want to participate. Correct. Okay. Well, I am curious if there's anybody right now that knows that they would like to participate. If you want to speak up now and then I can also follow up um, with folks. But and some people are transitioning off the board. And so, yeah, I was curious if anybody knew right now if that's something you would definitely want to be on the list for or if you. Can Kassara reiterate the offer? Sorry. Sure. So I am looking for um, essentially for community members to assist in an equity analysis. So once we have some of these metrics, we know um, 
more of the kind of quantitative pieces, um, I think that's going to help us understand those trade-offs and the implications of these different alternatives. So then we can say, okay, what does that mean for equity? If we have, um, you know, more housing units, but, uh, you know, this road needs to be widened to five of five lanes. I'm just throwing this out there as an example, you know, understanding kind of what, how these things are connected and some of the implications, then having a, um, a centered discussion on equity. Um, Teresa. Oh. <laughs> that is a raised hand, meaning I'm in, count me in, pick me. <laughs> Awesome. And Kassara, are you looking for just sort of like how whoever wants to participate or are you looking for a, a certain number of ideally of folks from the DAB um, just so we know what to shoot for? Yeah, I mean, I, ideally uh, folks from, from the DAB because I think this is really where, uh, where you shine. Um, you know, you talk about this more than every month. I know, um, you know, you bring lived experience in addition to that. So I think um, you know, I, I don't want it to just be city staff, um, you know, doing this review. It's really important that, that it go to community members. Great. Thanks. Looks um, good. I have a question. Like how many times we need our, or let me say it in this way, how much work do you expect from us in that panel? Sure. I, I anticipate one meeting, um, probably two hours in length, but then I would share information in advance. So you can uh, you know, get familiar with, with what the alternatives are and, and some of the different attributes that we're looking at across them. And then share the, um, the evaluation metrics as well. So you have kind of the, the data piece to go with it. Um, which day you expect that meeting will happen like uh, in the week, like Monday, Tuesday? Whatever day works for you. <laughs> um, I, I do want to, you know, find find a time. Um, you know, I, I can make it work if it's during the day or evening. I want to find a time that kind of works best for the the group as a whole. That's great. Well, knowing the sort of general timeline that you're looking for, that you're looking for, um, and those parameters, why don't we get back to you? I'll I'll survey the board and make sure to invite new members joining next time or in January, and we'll we'll get you a group of folks for sure. Awesome. Thanks, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Gisera. All right, um, on to our next presentation for the evening. We have Nathan Davis here tonight um, providing an update on the community vision um, process. So I'll turn it over to you, Nathan. Welcome. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, this is my first time in front of the DAB. I hope it's not my last time. Um, I've only been with the city of Beaverton for a few months, but I've been, um, I'm the project manager for the community visioning process. Um, we are just getting to a point where we're going to be launching some of our key visioning strategies. Um, so I'll see if I can share my screen so I can talk through a little bit of what we're looking at and get some input from you, uh, hopefully on um, what we should be doing in terms of best practices. Um, I think thus far, um, what I've been doing has been, we, we had a community survey that we had go out um, in earlier, I guess it was August, September, predated me slightly in my position, um, but uh, we had a short community survey that went out about that time where we were able to collect some community input, um, but we have a long process ahead of us um, as, base, as what the vision committee has decided that we want to be able to do. Um, in previous years, there's been two visioning processes so far. I believe they've been in um, 20, 2011 and 2015. Um, and those visioning processes were really dedicated to the idea of um, getting as many people into the room as possible, getting as many ideas from the community as possible, and then creating a little bit of kind of like a strategic plan. And I think based on what we experienced in past visionings, um, in terms of getting actually representation across the community in those visioning processes, as well as some of the challenges that we've seen with COVID, um, allowing us to do some of the strategies that we've used in past years. Um, we're gonna have to restructure things. And I think we're gonna be able to restructure some things for the better. Um, so, so just some key background information, because I think these words get thrown around a lot. And people kind of have different understandings of what visioning is. Um, generally, when I talk about visioning, when um, me and some of my peers talk about visioning, we talk at a very broad level. Visioning is mostly helping the city identify 
broader priority. So it shouldn't be identifying specific strategies that the community is going to be pursuing, more so identifying what our grand um, concept that the community should be pursuing one way or another. And ideally, we are able to arrive at those priorities through a process that's able to engage the community as a whole, be able to talk through experiences of folks who live in the community, identify what people want to see in their communities long term. Um, Beaverton's been unique in that they've been doing their visioning process every five years. A lot of communities, when they do visioning, it's a good 10, 20, 30 years in the future that they look. Um, those have both costs and, uh, and benefits uh, for doing it either way, but um, that's previously what, what the community has been done. Um, one thing that I do want to get clear is that in this visioning process, I we here at the city recognize that um, that the community gets utilized a lot and groups like the DAB get used a lot for um, providing input on some of these feedbacks. I mean, I, I now recognize I am the second person um, coming to you today and asking you for feedback on a process. And I wanna appreciate the time that you guys have. So what we want to be able to do with our visioning process is ideally build on some of the work that's already been done while also making sure that we're being intentional and going out of our way to communicate with folks that generally don't get included in these kinds of visioning process. I should say, um, with the first survey that we had go out, we had about 600 responses total, which is not a huge response, but it's a decent response. Um, but we saw that um, the vast majority of the folks that responded to our survey were um, older white folks, which for better or worse, does not count for the community as a whole. And so we wanna make sure that we are intentional and going beyond with um, what we are doing. And so, like I said, what our process is going to be, uh, we are going to be relying some on past work. Um, a, a big part of my job these past couple months that I've been on the job has been going back through a lot of community plans and kind of seeing um, where they've had outreach, what some of their conclusions have been through the outreach that they have done, um, identifying community priorities in various areas, and um, doing some of that initial groundwork of having a survey to be able to see just generally the priorities that the community has put in the past, are those the ones that um, that the, the city would like to see, or the, the community would like to see the city focus on. Um, beyond that, we've been trying to do a little bit more outreach with the community itself, um, based on a lot of the good work that you all have done. I think any of these plans, they, they don't work out well unless the community has some level of ownership. It's impossible to have the entire community to come in and decide what survey questions we're gonna be asking folks. Um, but we're as much as we possibly can, we wanna include committees, community organizations, um, not just city staff and deciding um, what we should be asking the city or the community to begin with. Um, one of our next steps will be a community survey, which I think Alexis has emailed out to all of you. I'll be following up with you again with it. Um, we're gonna be doing a community survey in early 2022 um, that is going to be asking uh, what, what we're going to be accomplishing with the community survey, hopefully, is um, letting the community know what priorities the, the city has put on various issue areas and getting feedback on um, what whether or not those priority areas are accurate with what the community wants to see, um, as well as allowing for opportunities for folks to be able to um, broaden the horizons a little bit and provide new ideas for how we might be able to do things differently as a city. Um, that's only going to be one facet of our input, though. Uh, surveys are very limited in a lot of respects. Um, we did an online survey earlier. Um, we can do online paper surveys, but I think what's going to be more important and more key for us is we want to be able to do community outreach in places and go to where people live to be able to collect information from them. So we'll have surveys there that people can take and they can um, take them online, but we want to be able to get put boots on the ground um, ideas have been thrown around like putting um, putting data collectors at every grocery store in town to be able to um, really be able to ask people questions about what do you like about living in Beaverton? What would you like to see done differently? Um, along those lines, we want to have um, focus groups with key community groups, um, particularly groups that are not included in a lot of these discussions. Um, and we want to be able to make sure that we are um, paying folks for their opinions. I think a thing that has been recognized is that you can't just go out and hope people join your groups for input. Um, so we wanna be able to make sure we value the opinions of folks that are giving their time um, to tell us what we should be doing with the city. 
And once we've gathered all this information, ideally what we want to be able to do is bring folks back together, bring folks to the table, and do some summits. Um, this is a little bit more of an ethereal idea, and we haven't completely developed it fully, but I think what that will look like is we will take the, all of the input that we hear back from the community um, when we do a survey, when we do focus groups, when we do community outreach, put that back in front of the community to be able to better understand um, what the community was saying when they told us these various things through these input processes. And that ideally should help us be able to identify a plan and identify a vision that the community wants to see, um, at least over the course of the next five years, if not longer. And so why I'm here in front of you today is I want to be able to get a little bit of feedback on um, what we've been trying to do. You know, we, a lot of this work of like putting together the plan has been done in-house and I don't like doing everything in-house and then just releasing to the community. So I'd love to be able to um, get this kind of in front of you and see where, where our shortcomings are and where we need to be doing things better. Um, uh, you know, our methodology is ideally we want to be, we want to have it be an iterative process where we are planning things, taking it to um, good community groups like yourselves and um, getting feedback to be able to see where we might not be hearing from folks or where we could be doing things better. Um, I had sent out the community survey and I'll send it out again. The community survey that is currently being drafted is very bulky, ugly, and um, probably would take way too long for people to finish. Uh, but we'd love to be able to hear your input, um, not today necessarily, but if you could take the time to be able to fill out the survey within the next week or so, um, I'd love to be able to hear your input and see how could we be wording these questions better to be able to get the best input impact back um, as well. Teresa, I think you have your hands up. I'd love to. I do, yes. I apologize if I'm interrupting your presentation. Okay. I uh, saw the big bold, how can you help us? Could you help us? And so I just wanted to shed some light on my thoughts. It, would it, is now an appropriate time or should I wait a little bit longer? You know, go ahead. I think, I think it's fine. That, that's all right. I'm happy to have some back and forth. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to touch base really quickly uh, regarding, I know you also presented to city council last week on Tuesday. So good to see you again. It's funny, you make one council meeting in a quarter and then you catch up on all the important things. It's fantastic. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that on your methodology, I know that you had reached out to many of the boards, committees, and commissions. We certainly had a representative from Visioning come and visit us, encouraging us to do that. I know that the Neighborhood Association committees or NACs um, were exposed to the opportunity to take the survey. Um, I don't know if you are aware. I am a nerd on this type of things. I'm just going to Put you up on game, Nathan. So a okay. lot of the people who are in those NACs are exactly the demographic that you received. Um, mm -hmm. That some NACs are more diverse than others, but typically the people who participate are that, um, with a sprinkle of other. If I'm, if you understand what I'm saying, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you had threw out the idea regarding doing some solicitation and data collection at grocery stores, fantastic idea. Just to be a bit more specific on that, weekends, hot time for people to go to the grocery stores. But I'd also like to add that you include culturally specific grocery stores like Halal Markets, H Mark. I live next to the I'm I, Uwajimaya grocery store off of Western and Beaverton Hillsdale Highway. So when you are talking about those types of things, I think the first thing that comes to mind is Fred Meyer or Safeway, Albertsons, and that's not necessarily the demographic you have expressed you want to reach out to, and that is certainly not the only grocery store chain in town. If you catch my drift, Dollar Tree is a grocery store. If you go to Whole Foods off of Shoals Ferry, you can catch just as many people on a Saturday, Sunday at the Dollar Tree right next to Whole Foods as you would the number of people going to anywhere else. So the types of places, discount places that do also sell food products that people go to, if you're looking for people who live in apartment complexes, low-income single people, those are the type of people it, that I know the city wants to reach out to and touch. And so just throwing that out there. Also, haven't seen a whole lot of information in the flyers that go out 
I know that the city puts a certain number of mailers every year. Personally, I would recommend you don't do it around election time. So I don't know if you heard Mark Sansusi talk about how 2022, especially in May, is a big time for Beaverton as far as elections. May is not a good time to have mailers. Sorry, when you have a bunch of political mailers, your regular everyday grocery discount mailers, and then you have another set of mailers coming out. I can't speak for anyone else on this board or anyone else in the city, but so many mailers, I throw them away. If you just have a few at a key time and working for the city, I imagine you're more aware than me, for example, about the hot times. Um, that if you don't know, I recommend having a conversation with Alexa. She's been around the block a time or two. She knows a good time to mail things out. And when it's crazy season in City Hall um, to not do certain things. So just wanting to throw that out there as an avid civically engaged person in Beaverton and uh, really wanting this to work. I'm not surprised by the data, but I certainly, like I said, want 80% of residents to come out and contribute. How about that? So thank you for the time and I yield it back to you. Thank you, Teresa. Teresa, by the way, thank you. your presentation put me at ease for my presentation. I love being able to hear your, your thoughts and um, on, on uh, what was going on with the DEI plan. So I, I really appreciate being able to um, hear everything. So you, you did a wonderful job on that. So I wanted to Thank you for that. But a great feedback as well. Yeah, I think what we're currently looking at, particularly when we're doing community outreach, um, really ideally getting at the idea of, you know, going where people are, and that's not just the obvious places. And so I, yeah, I, I love the idea of like, Dollar Tree was one that I had not think, thought about, but um, things like Halal mar Marketplaces, H Mart, Awajimaya, those kinds of places were on, were on our list. So if you have other ideas like that, keep throwing at, at us. We can always, um, we, we are hoping to have a little bit of an outreach team. We might be doing a hiring process eventually um, to be able to pay some folks to be able to be out there. And um, on those weekends, on those days when people will be more likely at those spots to be able to get feedback. Um, Cause I think that's, that's a key thing um, that we wanna be able to accomplish is make sure we're visible, make sure people know that we are doing this work and feel like, and make sure that people feel like they were asked. Um, I think if we can come away with this, that um, you know, we can come up with a visioning plan. Hopefully, it's representative of what the community wants. But I think one of the big things is people should feel like they were engaged and involved in this, and whatever way that we can do that is is fan is going to be better. Um, so, so yeah. So along those lines, um, we are going to be doing a survey. We're going to be doing outreach. We'll have a bigger uh, push come early 2022, I think we're looking at February, March for being our big push in terms of marketing. And the the idea of no mailers in May, I think is a good thing to be able to be aware of that, that it can be a mess to be able to walk into. Um, I think right now we're looking at some digital strategies, but I think with the VAC, we've been having conversations with them. You know, we got, we have to go beyond just digital methods because like you said, when we, when we did our first survey in um, August, September, you're right. I mostly went through a lot of those traditional channels, and that's why we got the the, the uh, demographics in of that survey that we got. Um, so I guess the things that I would like to generally ask you all, and these are probably questions that you're asked on a very regular basis, so please forgive me, uh, but I would love to kind of hear from you. What are some of the best practices that you've seen um, with engaging um, Beaverton as a whole and has been able to get communities out there? What are some pitfalls that you've seen the city in particular, but other organizations as well fall into? And um, just on what you've heard so far, or if, you know, uh, what, what kinds of processes do you think work and wouldn't work in Beaverton? Rachel, yes. So I sort of have more questions than 
actual responses to your questions. That's fine um, too. I'll also take questions. <laughs> cool. So my one of my questions would be around your first question. Um, I don't know how effective the um, city's strategy was this year around recruitment for boards and commissions, but I know that that recruitment strategy definitely looked a bit different than previous years. Um, so I guess I, maybe I would even, I don't know if you know the answer to this, if Alexis maybe knows the answer to this, um, if, uh, that was found to be more effective or not, but if so, I would say follow some of the things that, um, the city did in that regard. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to ask is actually regarding the, the survey itself. I was noticing that, um, so for each of the sections, for the most part, the format is very similar um, in terms of being asked to rank from it should not be a high priority to it should be a high priority. But economic, the economic empowerment section is different. And I'm wondering uh, why it's different, um, where you choose your top three priorities and you have a space for choosing a different one, whereas the other sections don't give that opportunity. So yeah, what's the thought process behind that? I'll, I'll confess, there's not a ton of thought process behind the difference. I think there were some um, differences in um, strategies that we just wanted to kind of put out in front of people. I, I'm unsure, quite honestly, which of those is better. Um, I think something like, I think the reason why economic development had a slightly different approach is because we wanted to be able to find out what are the top three um, strategies that people have real interest in. Some, some issues I think are um, very, very practical and very understood by the community at large. And so it's very easy for folks to rank things from low priority to top priority. Other things that may be more of interest for folks to be able to rank one through three. I don't necessarily know if that's true, but um, really this was just kind of a draft to be able to get out there. And I think having a difference in the format makes it slightly, makes people's eyes glaze over slightly less <laughs> when you go through the walls of um, feedback. Um, so I think I think that, so yeah, please, please be mean when you go through and have comments on these things. So I think that's the kind of thing I wanna be able to hear um, is like this, this doesn't make sense uh, as a person who would be taking the survey. Um, I would be able to more intelligently answer this kind of question over this kind of question. Those kinds of things are very helpful. Um, uh, let's see, what was your other comment about? Your other comment was about boards and commissions. Um, I had a follow up question on that. Did you think that um, with the, the amount that you know about boards and commissions being done this year, did you think that it was more successful? Um, is that the reason why you would have asked, asked that? Yeah, I that was my question. I know that they, they followed a very different process in the uh, in the interview process was different. The recruitment process was different. I know they had some in person stuff at um, the food cartel uh, right next to City Hall. I know that they had um, some additional reach outs on like uh, I think Spanish speaking radio stations and stuff, um, things that I hadn't really heard of before. So. Um, yeah, I was just wondering how how that went, uh, if it actually um, touched anybody different or not. Yeah, I confess I would not be the person to know since I haven't experienced another recruitment process. But well, I think Alexis, might, you might be able to talk to this. Otherwise, I can easily talk to some of the folks that would have more um, knowledge about this process. Yeah, I, I will just say I, I haven't seen the data quite yet. We will see um, that in terms of um, like demographics of applicants, um, but I haven't seen that quite yet. I think anecdotally, there's a sense that yes, that there was, uh, that it was successful in terms of getting more people in the, in the applicant pool, both um, age and race um, and income. I guess those are three things. <laughs> age, race, and income diversity in the pool more than before. Um, but again, we have to see sort of what those numbers look like that are not anecdotal. And then also what, how did that translate to who actually ends up on boards? A little analysis will still be done, but definitely some cool things that hadn't been done before. Then I would say, Nathan, you should follow up with Alexis for those specifics because I think there could be some really valuable insight in there as to how you can reach some more people with the survey. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think, yeah, from what I've heard of that recruitment team, it seems like they have done some 
interesting or like some revision of some of their strategies. And so I'm excited to hear how exactly the results of that, but um, yeah, that'd be a good thing to look into. Are there other thoughts or questions about the visioning process in general or specific? Yeah, so this is constantly Teresa, evolving. You... Oh. oh, I'm sorry, Teresa, did you have your hand up again? Sorry, or was it... I did, yes, thank you, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to contribute to the discussion we just had. I was a part of the campaign for a few of those meetings and what uh, was done differently was that several members of boards, committees and commissions went out into the community to have those one-on-one -on -one sessions and talk about the board committee and commission um, at various events around the city. And by having that reflective representative there, there were people who spoke various languages um, and people who know each other from around town. Word of mouth is still a very powerful thing and people using their own platforms, social media, LinkedIn, whatever, to communicate what was going on. And so I cannot say that that was entirely what happened, but from my contributions in that and what I saw firsthand, uh, that was what was going on. I also wanted to just throw out there uh, as far as the community vision and what is important to people um, and people's ability and capacity to understand the priorities that a lot of people within the city of Beaverton also pay attention to city council's priorities and what we can budget. I think people are very sensitive to the fact that the city in this COVID time um, can and cannot afford to do certain things. And so uh, if anyone understands the struggle of money, it's the people who live within the city of Beaverton. And one quote I really love that I learned in leadership, leadership Beaverton was, you know, those in our community with the least give the most. Um, we're all here on this very Zoom, giving our time, uh, not necessarily monetarily. So um, you'd be surprised with what community members can and will give. And I think if you just ask, be prepared because um, if you ask for an honest opinion, I'm not entirely sure you're ready for it, but go get them champ. All right, go ahead, Nathan. Appreciate that, Teresa. Yeah, I, I mean, I think just with the first round of um, surveys, which is going to be nowhere close to what we're going to be able to actually get through interviews and focus groups, I think we were already kind of revealing some of some of those opinions that folks had, and um, and also just the the willingness of folks to be able to give their opinion in, in the city of Beaverton. So I think it's a it's an exciting time. And so so the thing that I will ask of you guys, if you guys can take some some time um, later on. When you're looking at the community survey, big things we want to be able to see: are we being um, are we being thoughtful with the way that we're asking um, questions around demographics? We have a section that is dedicated specifically towards community and engagement, and inclusion, trying to identify how well included folks feel into Beaverton, um, and like, are those the right questions? Are we asking those the right way? Um, is this something that needs to be measured? Should we be figuring should we be thinking about this in a more um, idealistic fashion or do we need to keep it more at a practical level and then we have uh, a set number of topics we have topics on safety transportation housing economic development land use planning um, and homelessness and those are the big issues that seem to come up in previous surveys as well as um, in some of the previous research that the community had done um, one are those topics correct and two, how do we make sure that we are um, reflecting the various needs of the entire community in our questions and each of those issues? Um, so I'd, I'd love to be able to hear your input on that. Um, if, if you can take, take a little bit of time and, and look through our very messy draft of a survey that we have right now. Um, and so, so, yeah, so I, the other thing that I will say is we eventually will be having focus groups. Um, those are a little bit further down the line. We'll probably be looking at those come. April. Um, we're going to have those be consultant led, um, but we are going to be um, giving people the opportunity, um, community members just themselves, be able to 
react both to the results of the community survey as well as to be able to talk a little bit more about their experiences in the city of Beaverton. Um, we want to be able to make sure that we compensate folks for their engagement in this process. Um, and we will be doing outreach both through community organizations as well as um, ideally through some word of mouth um, um, and, and marketing that we're hoping to do as well. So um, I apologize, I will have to run off shortly because I am double booked. I have to also give this presentation to BCCI tonight, but I do want to give you guys, an, I want to first thank you so much for giving me a little bit of a platform to be able to talk to you all. Um, but do you have any other thoughts or questions? I, I hope this is not the last time that I'll be in front of Dab. Yes, Teresa. Thank you, Nathan. I apologize for monopolizing the time a little bit, but um, I know you're new, but there are a ton of surveys that have been done before. And so sometimes when you ask the same groups over and over and over and over and over again for the same questions, it, it, uh, you might not get the type of answer you're expecting in a nice way. And that might not be politically correct, but I'm just gonna throw it out there. Um, that believe it or not, the DEI annual report has some fantastic data for you, uh, if you would like to read that. And not that I'm biased or anything, of course, it's the DEI annual report, but it does, in my opinion, show what that can look like. You looked at equity and inclusion, and from the standpoint of, even if all the projected 100,000 community members within Beaverton wanted to civically engage, right, there realistically isn't enough space on board committees and commissions. And so even if everyone in the city rotated on and they volunteered at community events, there are still things that would go undone by people who otherwise really want to do it, right? That's just numbers, pure and simple. Looking at the demographic of people who currently are volunteers within the city, that information is in the DEI annual report. Uh, looking at, you know, what people want and desire. Uh, I know that the previous vision plan showed that. Um, there are some tidbits laid out in um, the DEI annual report again, as well as um, you touched on homelessness. I'd refer you to the housing five-year action plan. Um, if you see someone on the cover that looks familiar, I don't know who that person is, but they looked great in that picture. And it shows homelessness, affordable housing, and it really touches on what people want, expectations. Um, third thing, before I pass it over to Brandon, is that when the internal team, internal equity team, in addition to uh, HR, had a, an internal evaluation for the city of DEI, I hope my statement makes sense, but uh, that really is reflective of what's going on. And I say that just to touch the point that as equitable and inclusive as all of the community members are and can be, and how much we are able and willing to contribute, that the most powerful people in the city of Beaverton are not necessarily elected officials, but the city staffers, because they truly make things run. And so ensuring that the staff, including you, because you two are important, um, are feeling a part of the community and contributing to that DEI work is significant. So I know I had said a lot of things. So Brandon, I saw your hand, go ahead. No, that was all really pertinent and solid information for him as he moves forward with his uh, endeavor. So thank you. Um, Nathan, I was just looking over that report or not report rather, but the draft of the vision survey. And um, I see community like listed, but you know, that could go for either way relative to like your dominant culture or non-dominant. I don't, uh, I, I think there's an opportunity to just name diversity and equity, equity and inclusion as a, as a title. Um, but, but around that, um, I think that that third question that you, the reason why I raised my hand is like, it was just like a no brainer to me. Um, that third, that last slide you had up, the number three question, I think if you added that as an optional, optional question to like POC, you'd get some really solid feedback. That was it. Thank you. That's great. Great feedback. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Teresa. I know you felt like you were monopolizing time. All of your feedback was very helpful, though. So I'm hoping 
Yeah, even though you're going to be off dab, I hope I can somehow reach out to you again sometime and get, get your input on what we're going forward with. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, Alexis just asked, when do I want to hear feedback from? Um, we're hoping to get it by the end of the year. So no huge rush. Um, but yeah, whenever you have a chance, um, I'll, I'll send that out again. Um, but I, I really appreciate any feedback that you guys can give us on um, on that survey, as well as just the the process as a whole. Um, it's It's always great to be able to talk to to make city committees like this and your time's really valuable. So I, I appreciate that. So, um, but thank you guys so much. Um, I, I will be sending you my email contact if you need anything from me, but um, thank you again for, for your time. I'm gonna run off to BCCI now. So <laughs> you guys have a wonderful night. Thank you. Okay. We're running a little behind schedule because those presentations have been very exciting. Um, but it is now time for our 2022 elections. So um, my first question is, does anybody need us to reiterate a description of the three officer positions? We have chair, vice chair, and recorder. Anybody have any questions about what any of those positions entail? Amen. So could you please um, explain what the duties will be like with shortage uh, sentences? Because maybe some people, they don't know what the actual uh, duties and uh, maybe they will be interested after you explain that. For each of the positions you're asking? Yes, please. Sure. Um, so briefly, I'll start with Cheryl. I'll let Teresa do um, vice chair and recorder is pretty simple. Um, chair, um, you lead and facilitate our meetings. I have, you have seen me do for the last couple of years. Um, you work with the leadership team, which includes the vice chair and um, Alexis as a staff liaison to help plan each of our meetings. Um, you represent the board on occasion at um, various public settings, sometimes presenting at city council meetings. Um, or giving testimony. Um, I've also worked on some special projects on occasion. Um, it is a, a bit more of a time commitment. Um, I would say at least, at least like maybe an additional three to five hours a month outside of our board meeting, depending on what else is going on. Teresa, wanna talk about vice chair? Yes, thank you, chair. As vice chair, I support the chair and I too am a liaison at events. I love wearing my little name tag that says diversity advisory board with my name on it. And I would say an equal amount of time for outside of this meeting additional work. So we have our leadership meetings where we plan the structure of this meeting. And we have conversations with Alexis on guest speakers to come and speak to us. And yeah, you get out of it what you put into it. So if you put a lot of time in going to other meetings around the city to understand what is going on and then share that with your fellow DAB members, that's great. That's extra. So if you want extra credit, kudos. If you want to, of course, attend the diversity advisory board meeting, attend the leadership meeting to plan and take an additional hour just to make sure you are prepared for that. That's what it is. So I have a little bit extra duties being the liaison for the housing technical advisory group. And so I also attend those meetings and I'm vice chair of HTAG. So, but I'm special. So don't, you don't have to do all of that. Just the two hours you're here, potential one more hour of leadership and then another hour to an hour and a half of uh, homework, which I feel like all of you are capable of doing. You're all wonderful 
well-prepared, strong, independent people who are capable of doing it. So I have faith in all of you. And Recorder, as Rachel mentioned, is fairly easy. There is a Diversity Advisory Board Facebook page that is maintained, not daily, but on occasion, I would argue quarterly. And you take notes. You are given a template in advance of the meeting and taking notes. It's more like filling in the blanks. So you know more or less who is here. And once the meeting is over and you filled in all of the notes, you submit that to Alexis. Thankfully, our meetings are recorded. So if you feel like there was something you missed, you can go back and watch it, which is great. Cool. So there you have it. Um, I'm going to let Alexis lead the election process. I know we already have some nominations and uh, we'll have an opportunity to add to those nominations if there are any. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so last meeting, there were some nominations that I checked in with folks to see if they accepted those nominations or declined. Um, we had a little bit of both, um, but what we, what we do have moving forward, or what we currently have on the slate for nominations are um, Ahmed for chair, uh, for vice chair, Shara and Ahmed are both on that list. And for recorder, we have Rihanna on the list so far. And all of those folks have accepted those nominations um, as possibilities. So just wanted to first open it up for any additional nominations. You can nominate yourself. You can nominate somebody else on the board. Um, if you get nominated and you want to decline, um, you are allowed to do that. Um, but we need to get all the nominations for all three positions in the on the list first and then the process is to vote first on chair and then vice chair and then recorder and so that you can be nominated for multiple things at once and that can shift so that's why we start with um, voting in a certain order and we don't do it all at once so other nominations for folks for any of those positions um or questions? yeah sorry okay ahmed do you have a question did you want to nominate like I, I want like everybody to be here. So how many member we miss? We are missing some folks and they are not um, able to vote if they're not here. Um, it, you are able to nominate someone if they are not here and they could still be voted in. But Monica had another engagement, couldn't be here tonight. Anusha is sick, um, couldn't be here tonight. Um, and we're missing a couple of other folks. Um, so do we need to do the election this meeting or we can we wait till like more people uh, no, to be in the meeting? It's slated for tonight so that we have an incoming leadership group that can help me plan for January and uh, beginning of the year. We also have plenty for quorum right now. Yeah. Um, I was just going to nominate a couple additional nominations. Uh, chair is going to nominate Rahana for that and for recorder I was going to nominate uh, Kiral if he's interested. All right, so uh, Kiral, I know that you are, we still couldn't quite get you your video on, but I believe that you're here with us. And Rehana, I know you're here with us. If you wanna just put in the, speak up or put in the chat, if you accept or decline, the current nominations. Um, thanks, Rachel. <laughs> thanks for that. I'm not sure if I'm able to, first of all, um, I'm an intermediate. I'm not um, a Beaverton resident. So I don't feel it's fair for a non Beaverton resident to be chair because I'm not involved in the day to day events of the city. I don't know what happens in the cities, in the, in the uh, residences so much. Um, I'm not as civically engaged as the Beaverton residents are. So that's why I feel it's not fair for me to be as an inter intermediate be the chair. I feel I would feel more comfortable at Beaverton resident be a chair. And secondly, I also feel that I don't have extra time. I can commit outside of the meet meetings, but I really appreciate your nomination. And, uh, you know, uh, sad to see you go and sad to see Teresa go, uh, but I wish you all the best for your future endeavors. Thanks, Rihanna. So I will not add you to the list for chair. Carol, do you are you okay with being on 
the list for recorder nomination. Oh, I want to continue as a member only for now as there's a lot to learn with his answer in the chat. So we will not add you to that list. Any other nominations? All right. Well, if there are not any other nominations, then we can go ahead and uh, vote. And I'll just, um, so I will just review again what the nominations are. So we have for chair, I'll put this in the chat. We have for chair, we have Ahmed, for vice chair, we have Shara and Ahmed. And for recorder, we have Rihanna. I would like to make a motion to vote for Ahmed for chair. Can I get a second? Um, and seconds. Sounds good. All right, all in favor of Ahmed as chair for 2022, if you can raise your hand or say aye. Thumbs up, great. Wonderful. All right, I see everybody raising their hand or putting their hand, their thumbs up. <laughs> so congratulations, Ahmed. And Yay! You have a chair for 2022, that's wonderful. Um, it also by chance makes the rest of the vote easier because then we only have one person in each of the remaining positions um, who will also be wonderful candidates. Um, so maybe we'll just take one vote on that. So can I have a, a motion to approve Shara for vice chair and Rihanna for recorder for 2022? So moved. Seconded. Excellent. All right, all in favor? Raise your hand or signal as such, all of you. Thank you so much. All right. Congratulations. Yay. Late for 2022. That was very easy. Thank you all. Um, thanks to all of you. And we're really looking forward to, I look forward to, to working with you all. I'll reach out and be in touch. Um, and also Teresa and Rachel um, are transitioning off, but they have offered to at some point when it makes sense, probably in January, that we could have an overlap meeting and, and also just help um, welcome the new new leadership in and pass off any any tips and, and thoughts. So um, thank you all. Pass it back to Rachel. Thank you for our trust team. Like um, this is huge for me. And uh, I think it's a, a new responsibility that um, to represent our community. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, Shara, congratulations. Finally, Thanks, we work Ahmed. together. It's really a big honor for us, especially me and Ahmed, yes. two Iraqi people. We can't speak out in our country. And right now here in the Verse Advisory Group to be a chair and vice chair, it's a big honor. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think this is first time in, in the history of Beaverton that we have like Iraqis and to be a chair and vice chair in, in this committee. So it's a huge <laughs> responsibility will be on our shoulder, try to represent our community with, a, like, with the right way, much as we can. Like, let's hope we will, I know we are not angel, we will do mistakes. So be patient with us, we are still learning. And uh, let's hope we will not let you hate this committee or like advisory board after we will be like um and like in a new position thank you so much i really appreciate it all right welcome to our new leadership very excited mm -hmm. for uh for dab 2022. congratulations um, all three of you uh so now we'll just we don't have a ton of time left in our meeting um we're just gonna transition into sort of uh, an open chat opportunity to sort of say goodbyes for members who are transitioning off this year. Um, I myself am one of them and I just wanted to say that it has been an absolute pleasure to be a part of uh, this board and to be a part of the leadership uh, team for the last two years. Um, I've learned a lot 
and um, I've really enjoyed working with a lot of you. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, and I'm sure I will see all of you in, in different places in the future. So until the next time. Uh, I want thank to say you, something. Rachel. I want to say something. I wanted to say, Rachel and Teresa, you were wonderful pilot and co-pilot for us. And, uh, you are amazing, amazing, amazing. And uh, I wish you all the best, both of you. And uh, I congratulate Ahmad, Shira, and Rehana to uh, start uh, kind of um, following your footsteps and taking us in higher uh, position. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you uh, both uh, Rachel and Teresa. You guys have worked hard and appreciate your leadership and contribution. And, and Brandon, I'm going to miss you. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say something, I uh, e emailed um, Alexis a short um, kind of uh, uh, short uh, video regarding uh, winter solstice, uh, the way we in celebrate that long night in Iran. And if you are interested, you can play it at the end if you are. And uh, that shows. And uh, you know, in Iran, we say uh, the Shab Yalda, Shab means night and Yalda, means the coming something from birth. So uh, it kind of is a rebirth or something like that. And um, we have big celebrations for uh, that night. And um, if you see just a piece of it, that probably you would like it. Hey, Hannah, is your hand up for, for right now or is that? from before. I just want to make it sure I recognize you. It might, oh, is it my hand raised? Okay, no, it might have been from before, but yeah. just want to say a huge thank you to Rachel and Teresa and all the team, you know, for a successful year. It's been a fun 12 months. Um, and I hope, you know, whatever, wherever you, you guys are going to in the future that you're successful and you, you know, you um, enjoy your new, new roles wherever you're going. And, uh, you know, we're going to miss you greatly, but um, hope to see you around. I also just wanted to, I don't want to take up airtime if anybody else wants to share, but I also just want to say thank you so much to the three of you. Um, we are losing uh, three tremendous, well, not losing, we are, Pat, we are hearing three tremendous leaders with other spaces. Um, and it's just been an incredible honor to work with all three of you on the board over the last several years. Um, Rachel, you've been such a wonderful, consistent, um, you know, powerful advocate, um, and I think really strong communicator and really strong planner and facilitator. Um, and there's been a million nights where we've ended and we've said, oh my gosh, I can't believe you got through that whole agenda and we were successful and the board felt good and just, just really skillful um, at work. So just so happy to have worked with you and happy that you're not going far. Um, and Teresa, you are one of the, the most involved and dedicated folks um, representing in all spaces. And it's, you know, you're an incredible contrib contributor to, to this space as well, an incredible ambassador between the spaces that you, that you occupy um, and somebody who helps other folks enter the space and um, has just can speak from experience of being in each of the, um, the places I thought about when you talked about NACs earlier, you know, you, you're speaking from experience. Um, because you've tried out all those spaces. So I just really appreciate your depth of your commitment um, and what you share. Um, and Brandon, your time here was was shorter than I than I thought it might be just because you were out a year and then you came back or more than a year and you came back, but you came back with the same, you know, engagement and wanting to be a part of this and, and fulfill your commitment um, and your ties and your wisdom and your advice um, have just been so valuable to the work in general of at the city um, and on this board. and. Feel like you're such a thoughtful participant um, when you choose to speak up it's it, 
folks listen. I listen. So please continue to reach out and good luck in your work. And um, we hope that we get to continue to collaborate. So, and I, I just wanted to say, I, I wish that we could have gathered um, to sort of say goodbye to the year and to all of you, because that's a, it's a weird thing to end a year without getting to do that. So I'm sorry, feeling kind of bad about not figuring out a way to make that happen. So maybe we'll we'll figure out a way to get together next year in person um, and and invite folks back. It's, it's a special space and thanks for hanging in a couple of long virtual years. Like, so maybe during the holiday, we can just have one day going out to the cafe, places, restaurant, and just our group hang out and meet in person. Let's work on that. Yeah, Brandon and her, Rachel and Teresa, it was really pleasure meeting you. And uh, Teresa, I remember the first day when I came to the interview, you and Alexis, I was not able to talk that much English. I don't know how I get it. When, when, when they told me you accepted, I was so surprised. So really? <laughs> I really appreciate that to believing in me and always supporting me. And hopefully that's not the end of the journey. We can meet you again, be in touch. And when you have time, attend our meeting again. And I believe in social media, we can just be friends and sometimes ask each other about how you are doing. And good luck with your new journey. Thank you. Can I just do a quick shout out to uh, Alexis for making a really healthy and um, accessible space in the city of Beaverton in terms of being a facilitator of, of this work group. And then um, also to Teresa and Rachel. Wow, two excellent leaders, like young leaders. Keep an eye on these two. They're, they're doing great things right now, right? And so that's so exciting. Um, yeah, when I, this was like the first board, like official city board that I was on. So I'm thankful for the fact that I was able to center myself with DEI work um, in collaboration and community with really thoughtful people who are sincere, who are interested in making transformational change. And while like institutions and structures often have uh, flexibility issues or bureaucratic red tape, uh, I think the ball is moving in the right direction. Um, and that that this workspace will continue to be kind of a impetus of growth for the city to galvanize and move behind because uh, it's so much needed. And that, that's it. Thank you all so much for your, your time and um, you're all my friends. So it's not goodbye, but see you later. So long. <laughs> Teresa, I've seen you unmute and remute about half a dozen times now. Do you want to say something? You know, I talk a lot, so I will do my very best to make it brief. I would like to give appreciation to all of you. Um, Brandon, I remember when your first child was born and you brought those indigenous little booties and now your child is a walking, talking, functioning human that, you know, is opinionated and stuff, but you have more than one now. It's wild. Um, you know, I remember Manage and just being in awe of your work and your ability to be a champion for immigrants and refugees. And um, same thing with you, Ahmed, and to Ahmed in his first meeting talking about, you know, I tried more than once to be on DAB. It's so tough. Uh, and <laughs> just giving voice to the countless people in our community who want to be a part of a board committee and commission. And by Rachel Brandon and I stepping down, we create space for others. And we hope that you are equally as welcoming and receptive to their feedback and opinions and to share your personal stories and your true selves with them and make friends because gosh, it's hard making friends as an adult. Oh my goodness. Um, Please don't be shy to reach out to me. 
I would love to chat with any one of you outside of this meeting. I have a meeting with Raman on Friday, actually. We're going to have lunch, so don't be shy. And if you are too shy, then I might just have to reach out to you and ask if you're still alive because I know each and every one of you and none of you are shy. So <laughs> um, to the DAB members who are not here, you know, shout out to Caroline and Oswaldo and um, all of the people who came on when Rachel, Brandon and I came on who are not here on this meeting necessarily, who really shaped the work that we do, who really helped me contribute to the person that I am and thinking critically and challenging what I thought, you know, do I think what I think based on my opinion, based on what someone told me or based on true experience and hearing the experience of a diverse group of people. We are diverse, not just because of our ethnic background, but socioeconomic background, age, gender, all the ways people can be different. And yet we all come together for the common good of empowering one another and shedding light to how diversity, equity, and inclusion can look and should be within the city of Beaverton. And that's something people struggle with every day and in weekly meetings <laughs> at the city council. And that as contributing as all the boards, committees, and commissions are, um, we set the tone. So just be proud that you were a part of an elite group that was chosen and not only were you chosen, um, you know, part of a group where I truly believe if I were to see, you know, Brandon on the side of the road and I needed to jump, he would stop for me. Or, you know, if I saw a bully trying to, you know, approach Shara's child, I would fight the bully. Like <laughs> that sense of community and family um, is truly ingrained and I feel, empowered to talk to my fellow community members because of my interactions with all of you. So thank you to all of you. And I am confident that you will change lives. And I know we have only a few short minutes left in the meeting. So with that, I leave it up to Rachel and Alexis for any update, liaison report. I will crash your meeting for H tag reports. I'm not gonna leave you quite yet uh, until you find someone else to replace me to give you updates on housing. And yeah, stay tuned. Life is still gonna be exciting in 2022 for all of us. All right, uh, we do have to follow up the sappy time with more business, but it'll be really quick. Um, so uh, quickly, um, Teresa and myself and Alexis did present at City Council last week um, with an overview and feedback um, of the DEI plan uh, annual report. Um, so if you were not able to watch that, you don't need to watch that because you were part of our meeting. So congratulations. <laughs> um, but it went well. Um, we got great feedback from uh, city council and one of my colleagues actually emailed me to say that uh, he saw the city manager give uh, Dab a shout out on, uh, I think her LinkedIn or something like that um, and thanked us for our hard work. So um, all good stuff. Uh, Alexis or Teresa, did you have anything you wanted to add about either of those pieces? Okay, cool. Um, and then I guess, uh, oh, I did want to do one more thing. Um, our goals, we had uh, some goals for the year. We had three focus areas. Um, and then um, your leadership team put together a little document um, that Alexis is going to share right now. Um, that sort of shows uh, the progress that we made toward uh, each of those goals as they related to our three focus areas for the years, for the year, excuse me. So um, that's what's being shared right now. All the things are- To you all over email with, with the stuff liaison reports and some other notes from tonight. So please take a look. 
Cool. So all the things in green are um, the things that we did, the things that we accomplished this year. I think it's important to um, be intentional about that and to really reflect on um, all the things that we were able to do together. So take a look at that um, in the email later, unless you're able to read really fast right now. <laughs> fast to scroll. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of pieces on there. Um, the board did a lot this year. Sure did. And before I hand it over to Alexis for staff liaison announcements, I know Brandon gave Alexis a shout out, but I just wanted to piggyback on that and say that um, Ahmed and Shara, Rihanna, you're in for a real treat um, because Alexis makes being a part of the leadership team as easy as it could possibly be. Um, you couldn't ask for a better leader uh, than Alexis. So thanks. Uh, big, big thanks to Alexis for Thank all that you. she does to get us prepared and um, to make us look good and everything that she does to advocate for us at the city, which is a lot. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot that we do not see that she does. And um, yeah. big thank you. Hey, hey. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything you do, Alexis. It's a um, pleasure to work with all of you, actually. And uh, sorry, I didn't mention Brandon. We're going to miss you too. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's totally a pleasure and an honor to work with you all. Um, I will just share. So I sent, I just sent an email with uh, Money Jay's video and this definitely has an announcement and those priority goal areas and um, Lieutenant Kingsbury's um, summary, et cetera. So you should have everything you need there. I'll just show on the screen real quick um, staff liaison announcements so that we can look at those together. And I'll just highlight a few things. Um, you'll see there um, tomorrow night is the vote at city council finally on the appointments for next year. Um, but what is in the agenda bill and we expect to happen is that, as you know, Rachel, Teresa and Brandon are leaving, as well as a couple other folks that we haven't seen in many months, but we're on the roster still, Christian and um, Dennis. Mani Jay, Rehana and Raman, we expect to continue with us, um, thankfully. And then we have um, four other new members um, that will be joining us, um, two of which participated in the BOLD program um, and others of which are connected in, in various ways. Um, one led a, a uh, welcoming week event this year. Um, lots of great, so lots of really great energy um, coming in. So we look forward to, to getting everybody together in January. Um, the final DEI plan report is now up on the cultural inclusion page. So it has all of the DAB ratings and the, all the pieces that were missing before. So just know that you can always find it there and it's linked here if you need it. Um, we do have a notify me list, uh, a listserv set up now specifically for updates about shelter. Um, it'll be written so if you're interested in that, it's not very frequent, but um, we will be sending out uh, notes about when there's council items about shelter, et cetera. So just wanted to let you know, make sure you knew that there was a way to sign up for regular updates on that. Um, I don't know if any of you all participated last week in the first downtown equity strategy meeting, but they're doing some uh, meetings for residents in Beaverton. Um, so we had the first one last Wednesday. There's still another one this Wednesday um, that's focused on specifically on displacement. Um, and it's just gonna, it was a really, really great gathering last time. Lots of interpretation happening, um, breakout sessions and, and um, presentations with all with our consultant folks um, from Coalition of Communities of Color, Adelante Mujeres, Van, et cetera, that are there um, supporting and participating. So if you can make it to that meeting, please RSVP. Um, eligible for a gift card and just a really great conversation to participate in. So I wanted to let you know about that, that there's still a chance to participate in that. We are having a sort of a small, um, not widely publicized, but toy drive that benefits um, some families through St. Matt's, um, which we've done in the past, but there is a, a bin in the lobby of City Hall um, this week still, if you all, if anybody wants to donate toys. And then um, from the city team, uh, public information team, the winter lights displays are up. Um, so please visit those if you're looking for something to do for the holidays. 
Um, we are going through a website redesign that's going to launch. Um, and we're looking for some in some input about uh, about that. So if you're interested in giving some feedback, we'd love to improve that um, tool uh, and should launch sometime early next year. And then just some information about COVID-19, um, the latest um, kind of information and places to get vaccines and all of that. Um, and just so that you know that, yeah, that City Hall is, City Hall is finally open, at least on the um, first few floors um, and library and other buildings are open. Um, and, uh, and otherwise all city services should be available in some way or, or form or another, whether it's remote um, or on site. So just wanted to let folks know of that. And those are the announcements. Um, just one little note about next year, we will have just a regular meeting in January. So I'll connect with our new leadership to plan the agenda for that. We already have some presentations and things that are sort of in the queue for that. Um, but we also wanna think about how we welcome new members. And then we will plan on having um, a retreat in February like we usually do. Um, but we'll talk about the details of that and um, get a sense of people's comfort level of in-person versus virtual and what works best. Um, so I look forward to, to doing all of that, but wish you all um, a happy end of the year, um, however you celebrate or rest or rejuvenate. Um, take care. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, Much everybody. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Do we go live next year, uh, the January Hope. meeting? Hopefully. In I person. think we need, to, we need to have a conversation about that, and, and I'll probably need to survey um, folks and see what people's comfort level is. I certainly hope that we can do some in-person stuff next year. I don't know if it's January or if it's after that, but I, I'm committed to make that happen. I like it. Yeah. All right, take care everyone. Bye. Happy take holidays. Care. Love you all, I'm going to miss you. <laughs> yes.